Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Colonel Retired Chris Olshek um, from the Civil Affairs Association. I'm the Vice President for uh, Programs and Events. Uh, and uh, we have the great pleasure of having a, a worldwide uh, workshop today on uh, allied and multinational civil military approaches to what we're calling winning without fighting. Uh, that's the theme that we've picked this year. Um, and we'll get to everybody's different uh, perspective on that. Um, but what this is really going to be more than anything is a, uh, an overview and a review and an update uh, on the various civil military developments from around the world. And uh, so we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, Colonel Stephanie Totten uh, from uh, Tutton, I'm sorry, Colonel Stephanie Tutton from uh, the Office of Military Affairs in, in New York, uh, Dominique Gassauer, did I say that right, Dominique? Uh, from the Office uh, of the Coordination of Humanitarian uh, uh, Affairs, CIMIC, uh, or, or, or should I say SIMCORD. SIMCORD as it's known. Humanitarian Civil Military Coordination in UN speak is known as SIMCORD. It means civil military coordination. Uh, the UN CIMIC term means also civil military coordination and they are in fact related, they're complementary. Uh, one is a military uh, uh, coordination mechanism and the other is a humanitarian civil military coordination mechanism, which we should all be familiar with for those of us who um, are interested or involved in, or may be involved in uh, international humanitarian responses and with global warming going on, I think there's gonna be a lot more of that uh, in, in the future, especially um, So we have uh, uh, some great representation today. Um, for, for NATO, uh, we have Colonel uh, Stefan Mulich from the uh, CIMIC Center of Excellence. Uh, Stefan is coming to us from Berlin uh, uh, because that's where he is currently uh, on duty travel right now. So we, we appreciate that. Uh, his involvement in that, he's gonna enlighten us on the NATO perspective. Um, Dave Allen, also from the uh, UK, uh, Colonel Dave Allen. Uh, to uh, tell us of the UK is, uh, is working this issue. Um, and then the, uh, uh, not, not, last, not, last but not least, it's interesting, joining us from the Sahal, from, um, is it Minusca or Minusma? Is it, I'm sorry. Uh, Minusma. Minusma, right. Um, and, uh, uh, but he's actually gonna be talking to us about uh, the Canadian experience and task force polling uh, and the clinic work that they've done, obviously in response to the price frame and maybe provide us some perspectives on how uh, his, his new duty post uh, in all. So we've got quite a lineup today uh, and quite some presentations to get through. Um, what I wanted to do if I could just very quickly is to share of the screen. And so that's our workshop. I'm not sure if you can see that. Okay, so that's our workshop. Um, and then what I wanted to do was to show something that I, I posted earlier uh, in this symposium. And what I did is I, I grabbed the NATO strategic concept and the US national security strategy um, and, and put these citations up kind of for comparison. And when, when General Beaupere, Beaupere who was the, uh, who was the um, commanding general of the US Army, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, Special Warfare Center and School in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, um, is what this is replete with both from the NATO side and from the US side, the UN is already there um, in so many ways. And that is that we, we have to go to a whole new level 
uh, if we're talking about integration, which is what this is really about, um, at, a, at a much higher level of, uh, of intensity um, than we have. I mean, the, the, the idea of integrated deterrence on the US side is, is, is all over this, not just the interagency uh, and the tactical levels, civil military levels, civil military integration, but the last bullet there, integration with allies and partners. Um, and he's wholeheartedly agreed. Um, so the, in, the implied task there for particularly the US civil military professionals is we need to get to learn and understand more about how our allies and our multinational partners at the UN hey, level do this business. Hello? Mute your mic, please. So, um, so that's in part what we're doing today. I've already posted some links for the benefit of our, um, uh, our US professionals and where they can go to to get some training and information on this. And I, I um, Dominique, I, I was uh, I was remiss in not posting the OCHA uh, link to training resources on, on civil military coordination. Um, so if you would please do that, I would I much appreciate it. Chat rooms there as well. We need to get smart on this stuff um, because if we're going to be effective at our missions as civil affairs professionals, we need to know um, who our, our CIMIC partners are, our CIMIC and CIMCORD civil military partners are in the regions and how they operate and under what what authorities they operate and, and all that, just like they need to know how we operate. So hopefully we'll have a lot more uh, information and knowledge sharing going on in the years to come. And that's that's the purpose of this particular workshop is to open the pathways to that. So that's what we've got going on. Let me go ahead and stop sharing this. And what I'm going to do at this point is uh, if Stephanie and Dominique, if you are ready, please uh, go ahead and begin your presentation. Let me see if you can get your slides up. If you can't, then I'll, uh, I'll download them from you. Uh, I think I'll be okay. Just give me a couple of minutes. Stephanie, do you wanna get us started? Sure. Um, yeah. So, so thanks, Chris. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, to everyone. Um, I'm, I'm, I see a few people not actually in the same time zone with us, but um, uh, again, uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss CIMIC, um, civil military coordination. Um, Please understand, we're, we're coming at that. Dominique and I are coming at this topic from the United Nations construct with the field missions. Um, and I, I just wanna start off, and as soon as Dominique gets the slides up um, and we hit that second slide, you will see just exactly how, next slide, please. So, so this is this is the integrated mission, and just to kind of set the uh, the stage for this, we can see how multidimensional peace support operations are across the United Nations, and and kind of some of the the difficulties that that we are up against. Um, highly complex, um, and you see all of the different uh, entities that are part of this. There are specialized agencies, the funds and programs, World Food Program, World Health Organization, UNICEF is in there, um, the military and police component. Um, you see uh, kind of down there at the bottom in some of those pink boxes, you have the international uh, government organization, non-governmental organization. Um, there's bilateral partners with the host nation a lot of times. Um, we're seeing that in a couple of our, uh, our field missions right now, which is causing a little bit of um, angst and a little bit more uh, of a need to understand the space that we are all working in. And I think it, it is important to say that the United Nations, these field missions, we are trying to have the smallest footprint possible. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So there are a lot of people working in that small, small footprint uh, in some of the host uh, host nations, host countries that uh, the United Nations is in. Um, I'd also like to, to say that we are finding more and more um, that UN peacekeepers, and I'm, I'm kind of talking about that uniform component, um, but uniform peacekeepers are increasingly being asked to take 
a wider variety of complex tasks. Um, and some of these include building sustainable institutions of governance, not exactly what we, we were initially trained for, um, but there's human rights monitoring, there's security sector reform, um, support to DDR and the former combatants, um, and then of course the creation of safe and secure environment for humanitarian assistance. And uh, we, are, we are finding more and more that UN, these UN missions are going beyond that security and political aspects. And they, a lot of times they're including an environment, uh, I'm sorry, well, environmental, yes, environmental concerns as well, but uh, also the economic and development considerations um, in the different parts of the country. Um, so let's go to the next slide, Dominique. Um, so, so as as we're looking at this, and we kind of look right down into the UN CIMIC as a military staff function, I th I think it's also important to say that a lot of the Security Council mandates right now are including. Um, Again, some non-military tasks, and those are the protection of civilians. We have six missions that have a, a protection mandate associated with them. So that's the civilian harm mitigation, child protection eff efforts, the conflict-related sexual violence, and, and of course, human rights. So again, we have some traditional missions, kind of those traditional mandates, and then we're, we're also seeing more that have the protection of civilians as part of the mandate. So what we're trying to do is focus on, uh, focus the military, the uniform component on the information sharing. So we're looking at what we're calling uh, information pathways. We want to make sure that the military, the uniform component really understands the information that's being gathered uh, gets to the right people, um, not not so much that we have the we that we're responsible for all of the information and and we'll give it to the to the people who need it it's a definitely a two-way uh conversation um but we are pushing the need for that information sharing the the coordination the collaboration ensuring that our mission components the civilian side of these missions are part of the military planning uh so that we can get better fidelity on the information that we have um dominique next slide let's um, yeah, so this is this is what I pulled from the UN CIMIC policy uh, that uh, I talked about a little bit last year, a little bit more detail last year, uh, talking about that analysis estimate, uh, but trying to get to that so what, but again, we're, as I said in the last slide, we are really pushing the information pathways. Um, Next slide, I think this is, I wanna turn this over to, to Dominique, uh, go ahead, next slide, that's our cycle. Um, and we talked about that last year. Um, I, I am trying to minimize um, my discussion part so I can get over to Dominique. But one of the things that we have done in the United Nations, but really with the Office of Military Affairs is we have called in OCHA. Uh, OCHA came to us and we decided that this was a very, very important um, engagement and relationship that we needed to foster. And we now have, OMA now has quarterly meetings with OCHA uh, to discuss uh, who's doing what and, and to help educate the, the military uh, the military component as to the humanitarians, what their, their mandate is and how we can work together in that same space. And again, very small footprint. So there's a lot of people in that area. I just saw an, an, uh, a little message pop up about information pathways. Again, when the military uh, police are on patrol and information is gathered, due to that patrol or from that patrol, we want to make sure that the child protection advisors, the CRSV advisors, um, the, the gender advisors, both on the military side, police side, and also on the mission side, the heads of office, everybody is getting this information. So we have better fidelity on the situation and a better understanding of how to react to what is happening be, through early warning indicators, those type of things. So that's kind of what I mean. I hope that was a little bit better explanation of the information pathways. Dominique, I'm gonna turn this over to you because I think you have the good stuff this year uh, for the group. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Um, a, well, I, I don't wanna lose much precious time um, in, in any formal introductions, but 
the information pathways uh, question is actually a very good segue uh, to to the the section that I'm going to be discussing, which is the role of humanitarian actors and why why they matter for you as as military actors. Because as Stephanie said, we are increasingly operating in the same space. Um, the presentation I, I presented or I prepared for today includes a couple of very generic introductory slides uh, about OCHA's mandate and who we are as an organization. So that just gives you a little bit of background. Um, but in essence, what we do is try and coordinate a plethora of humanitarian actors that uh, come in very different forms. We have UN entities, like Stephanie mentioned, World Food Program, World Health Organizations, all the way to international NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and local NGOs. And we try and bring all of these organizations under one umbrella, look in one direction, have a coordinated approach to basically provide uh, humanitarian assistance to communities and individuals affected by crisis. These can be conflict or, or complex emergencies or natural disasters. Um, we also serve a coordination role when it comes to humanitarian civil military coordination because it's not possible for military actors to engage individually with you know 250 ngos un entities that we have for example in the democratic republic of the congo so what you have is ocha that has since 1995 been confirmed as the UN humanitarian civil military focal point that provides an interface so a sort of one stop shop for you to be able to understand what is the humanitarian footprint in a given context, what are we doing, where are we active, and how do we work together, because that will very much be informed by the actual context. Um, when it comes to information pathways, for example, and in the example that Stephanie mentioned when you have a patrol going out and we were both actually in Minusma before uh, being at headquarters, we often had these discussions, you know, we would have the Minusma patrols going out into uh, into areas that sometimes NGOs hadn't visited in months, uh, but we would, you know, be very open to receiving the impressions, the information, the feedback that those patrols were coming, especially when it came to protection environments, because protection, for example, is something that the force does to a certain extent, but the non-force elements of the mission, but also non-mission UN components also have a role in addressing. So how do we connect those dots and make sure that all the different entities involved with a role to play, with means to assist people in need, can actually play their part in full? So I'm just going to skip the first couple of slides um, that, that provide that information, and just to give you an idea of the scope that we're talking about. So. Um, Every year, OCHA comes out with a global humanitarian overview in December. The one for 2023 is going to be published in about two weeks' time. Uh, we're actually breaking records in all of the categories when it comes to people in need, people targeted, the amount of funding we need to address these needs. We're all really facing uh, pretty unprecedented numbers. And these are still numbers that uh, preceded the uh, the current situation in, in the Ukraine. So you can imagine how, how those have gone up even further. But what I want to say with this is that we are an actor to be reckoned with because we do represent a huge presence in a lot of the crisis affected countries that you may uh, be involved in either through a binational uh, deployment or a multinational deployment. Now, from the humanitarian side, we've developed the UN SIMCORD framework, which is, in all honesty, very, it's, it's the other side of the SIMIC piece, uh, but it basically looks at the same question and the need for dialogue from the humanitarian perspective, where the end goal is not to promote a political or security uh, based objective, but it's basically to protect and promote humanitarian principles so that we can actually do our work. Um, because one of the premises for humanitarian agencies to actually reach communities in need is by being perceived as a neutral, impartial, and operationally independent actor. And to do that, we need you to understand that this is uh, an important, uh, a meanwhile, a, 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 necess a necessary means to help people and populations in need. If 
the other side, and, and by that mean, I mean the adversary side, sees us as being siding with one side of the conflict, they would not grant us access to the areas under their control. And as part of our mandate as humanitarian organizations, we are under the General Assembly Resolution 46182, authorized to negotiate, engage with all necessary stakeholders in order to get that access, in order to reach those people in need. And the key elements of the UN SIMCORD framework are essentially information sharing, ensuring that we have a clear division of tasks and where possible, we can even engage in planning. Um, and, and we see coordination in this sense as a shared responsibility. And I'll be going into a couple of examples shortly. Um, the, this, this basically uh, outlines OCHA's role in civil military coordination, and also the fact that over the years we've been developing guidelines and policies together with member states in order to manage that relationship between humanitarian actors and military actors. Um, the Oslo guidelines will probably come to mind for you, which address mainly the, uh, the, the, the way we work together in natural disaster settings. And since then, we've also progressed into complex emergency settings. But a lot of what we do and how we engage really depends on individuals coming together and seeing the necessity of working together and the benefits, because where we work well together, we can really actually advance uh, our respective mandates. Um, I, I just wanted to put up this slide, which sort of shows back to back our understanding of the UN CIMIC framework, which is the policy that Stephanie mentioned. Uh, the latest version of that policy was actually published only uh, in January, February of this year. And that sees the, uh, the engagement and the, 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 the imperative to engage with not only humanitarians, but generally civilian, civilian components of the missions and beyond. And that includes development actors, but also, uh, as mentioned, the host nation. And on our side, it's, it's that interaction between the humanitarians only and the military actors. Um, the way we try and, and, and organize this civilian uh, military interface depends very much on the kind of context that we're working in. So when we're working in a natural disaster affected country or context, it's usually less um, controversial for humanitarians and militaries to work together. On the contrary, it's encouraged because you all have assets that we don't necessarily have. And in a relatively peaceful environment, it doesn't really pose a problem when humanitarians request military assistance. Um, instances like the Haiti earthquake of 2010 came, come to mind, the Pakistani earthquakes, etc. So there we have a number of important, significant humanitarian crisis situations where we had co-location of humanitarians and militaries in crisis response centers in the same location that were able to closely coordinate their efforts and whatever they had to bring to the table in terms of assistance. Now, as we move to the right of the spectrum, we move into situations that are more likely to occur in uh, complex emergencies or conflict affected contexts. And there you see slowly that distinction between humanitarian actors in, in orange and the military actors in green uh, going a little bit further away from each other. And the reason of it, that is just to make sure that our perceived engagement is managed and does not compromise our being perceived as neutral and impartial actors. We speak with all actors in those kinds of situations, whether they are non-state armed groups, even groups uh, qualified or classified as terrorist organizations, we can in principle speak to anybody. We have to for the purpose of, of achieving and, and sustaining humanitarian access. Um, and at the same time, we are of course uh, compelled to speak with military actors of, of regular armed forces as well, be that host nation, bilateral deployed forces or international forces or UN peace operations. In a situation like Ukraine, for example, we now have the, uh, the interlocutor um, set up where we have only OCHA being the interface between the humanitarian community and the Ukrainian uh, army in Ukraine, and we, we organize those meetings very concretely in neutral settings um, and that are not on UN premises to maintain that clear um, 
distinction. In other contexts, like in Mali, for example, we would be in a limited liaison uh, setup where we have liaison officers both on the humanitarian side and the military side that regularly engage with each other. Now, there's a perception that all of this has to go through the U9s, which is usually the case, and that is what the UN CIMIC policy you know, uh, promotes. From our side, the level of dialogue can actually go beyond U9. And we try and have a uh, close dialogue with our colleagues in the operations planning. Um, and, and this has worked out very favorably, especially in Mali and Central African Republic, where we have two of the biggest UN peace operations uh, currently deployed. Um, just to show you what a coordination setup looks like in concrete terms, here's the, uh, the setup in, in Bangui um, in uh, Central African Republic. Uh, so we have the different components represented from MINUSCA, uh, the force, police and civilian uh, components. We have the different entities from the humanitarian side that are represented and then in the last row, you see the other military um, and civilian actors that are also present in these meetings. This SIM cord cell is at the capital level. There are further eight SIM cord cells based in regional hubs or sect at the sector level uh, throughout the country that are usually co-chaired by OCHA and the MINUSCA force. Um, and in parallel to that, uh, there are also uh, informal communication channels between OCHA and non-state armed groups. And in the case of, uh, of uh, Central African Republic with certain private security military companies, um, depending on, on, well, that's, that's, that's a more critical aspect of the dialogue, but it has uh, occurred in the past. The principles for our condition, for our coordination are really around trust, transparency, decentralization, making sure that we're finding solutions on the ground, and pragmatism, making sure that we, we have a clear uh, objective in sight for, the, for the, the dialogue to be as useful as possible for all sides. Um, we have different mandates uh, within... Sorry, Chris, do interrupt me if I am going on for too long. Um, no, ma'am, um, you just keep going. This is very informative. Okay, I hope so. Thank you. Um, on the mandates, just a brief word, um, and I realize the slide has a bit of formatting that needs to be done, so I'll, I'll get that sorted out before it reaches you. But very briefly, um, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, UN peace operations have uh, protection affiliated tasks, and one of them is crucial to us, which is the the, the enabling, uh, the, the creation of an enabling environment for humanitarian action and assistance. That doesn't mean that we expect the UN peace uh, operation to now deliver humanitarian assistance directly, but we do rely on their support to create an enabling environment where possible. Um, and this, is, uh, this has been the case in, in UNMIS, it's the case in, in MINUSCA, uh, MINUSMA, as well as MONUSCO. And we have been uh, successful to varying degrees, uh, very much depends on the actual context, uh, the capability that the mission has, because of course, the mission has to organize its limited resources as per its mandate priorities. And then lastly, how the mission itself is being perceived on the ground by local stakeholders, including uh, possibly parties to the conflict. So in some contexts where, like in South Sudan, the UN mission is, is recognized as a relatively neutral party, we can have and allow ourselves to have a closer engagement with UNMIS when it comes to uh, requesting support um, in terms of logistics, etc. In a context like Mali, where the perception of the mission, and please do not get me wrong, I am not in any way qualifying the UN's mission um, as a party to the conflict, but it is perceived by some actors as being a party to the conflict. And the mere perception of that can pose some difficulties for certain humanitarian actors to have a close dialogue with the mission. And this is again where OCHA steps in to make sure that that dialogue happens regardless of these perception questions. And that interface is continuous um, because we need that continued dialogue across the line. So what kind of support can 
and has the force uh, provided in different settings. And as I said, this depends on the three factors, the, the actual mandate, the capability, but also the perception piece. We have the proactive engagement on the one side, so doing joint analysis uh, for the first mission footprints. Um, we've had, in the case of uh, Central African Republic, the mission support in reopening key supply routes um, and the use of mission assets to support humanitarian assessments. Um, <clears throat> in situations where we need to be more cautious from the humanitarian side, we do continue to have passive engagement at all times. <coughs> so here, for example, we would try to um, maintain distinction. One second, I'm losing my voice. Apologies. We try to make sure that our humanitarian action is clearly distinct from uh, CIMIC or QUIPS projects at all times. We also try and favor area security over armed escorts. So that means where we need to reach a certain area in a highly insecure environment, we ask the mission to basically secure the area before the humanitarian convoy deploys, rather than using an escort where we would closely follow the, uh, the armed escort. There's also the static support on securing airstrips or warehouses, and then also using joint um, UNDSS or mission uh, frequencies and, and radio rooms. Um, this slide just shows how the different aspects inform the level of engagement. And here on the last slide, just a couple of key points to, to remember on, on good practice that we have come to, to understand over, over the last uh, uh, years of, of engagement with uh, UN missions in particular. So, the importance of having mutual understanding of our respective roles and mandates, um, context appropriate responses. These are not cookie cutter responses that we can expect. Making sure that we have transparent engagement that is systematic and how we get that to that point is through functioning coordination mechanisms, country specific guidelines, training, and I will definitely put all the, the resource material and, and information platforms we have so that you can get informed on where our next civil military coordination trainings are taking place. Um, making sure we, we have good handovers between uh, deploying staff, that is a, that is a main major constraint that we have on the humanitarian side, but also on the military side with staff rotating in and out on very high frequent levels. And then crucially, ensuring leadership support um, and helping under making understand leadership, the importance and the vitality of these relationships. Uh, this last slide, and you'll be receiving this, gets, uh, gets you to a number of key resource documents and platforms, um, which you are welcome to consult. And I will stop here. Thank you. <coughs> Perfect. Uh, okay, so let me see. I don't. Um, I think the question uh, that Baskin's uh, your information pathways question was that sufficiently was that sufficiently addressed? I guess so. Great. So what I've done here is I've, as the discussion has ensued, I added, for example, the Oslo guidelines, uh, which are very important uh, to understanding uh, humanitarian civil military coordination at the international level, um, the different frameworks that are used, uh, which, you know, have become the standard uh, for any, uh, co collective uh, humanitarian, resp humanitarian response, uh, including U.S. forces and NATO forces. Uh, so these are very, very important uh, references to at least be familiar with uh, when working at that level. Um, do I have any questions? Uh, please raise I, your hand. And, Chris, I think uh, there was one and question. And you're from and where you're from and your question. Chris, I think there was one question on the chat about um, whether uh, we don't need militaries also to provide us with security and protection. 
And that's a really that's a really compelling question because we we often get sure. that as uh, as humanitarians. Um, and and the answer I'm going to give I know is 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 not always uh, clearly understood, but it it does work. So our way of ensuring access to these complex places, highly insecure environments is actually by building acceptance and trust with the communities, with the, the local stakeholders. So we only use or resort to armed escorts, for example, as an absolute last resort where we have no other means to reach a certain areas or if it is imposed by a party to the conflict. But we do manage in most cases to negotiate our access um, through dialogue at the end of the day. It might take more or less time to build that up, um, but we have found in our experience in, in many countries uh, over many decades that dialogue acceptance are, are the key ways for us to have sustainable access to these communities. Because it's not just about having a one-off access to do a food drop or a food distribution. We need to be there on a, on a regular sustained basis. Um, and access is also about, you know, it, it's a very complex question because in some areas, and Mali is a very good example for that, in some places we'll negotiate with uh, a, an armed group and they will be okay with us providing food assistance or digging a well, but they won't be okay with us providing maternal health care or education, which is now a key component of the humanitarian aid portfolio. So how we work in those situations is we try and build access progressively. We'll maybe enter with programs that are more acceptable to the armed group in question and then slowly build that trust and try and expand the range of services we're able to provide to the communities um, affected. But as a first solution, in principle, no, we with all due respect, we do not need your support to re reach these communities. Thank you. Right, and and I think that this is a, an important teaching point in in that um, you know we've got a couple of principles here at work. One is in, in is the comparative advantage that organizations like the UN have in what we would call persistent engagement. Um, they're constantly engaging uh, in in the regions and in in the uh, the host countries uh, on you know matters of, of uh, conflict and conflict resolution humanitarian issues um, and they are a very valuable source uh, for our understanding of that so that we can better advise commanders on on whether and how to engage it with other than lethal means um, to uh, create outcomes that are essentially sh shared among uh, across the board. So uh, getting to know who these people are and working by, with, and through them is, is immensely important um, because unlike, unlike the most of the military, uh, they are there constantly. They are uh, constantly engaged and, and have a constant presence in areas. Uh, and their eye is constantly in terms of information management on these areas. So they have they have amassed uh, situational understand a level of situational understanding that um, we, we don't really match, um, but with with which we could learn a great deal from, uh, so that we don't inadvertently uh, wander into something that we, we should. Advisors, commanders, on things like that. That's that's a very valuable uh, resource. Any other questions or comments on this? I'd, I'd like to just for a moment, Stanislava, I, I'd like to, you know, I, 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 I gave you a shout out there in the chat box because of your 1CA podcast appearance on this, this, this idea of civil military or military civil coordination in sort of what we call low, tech, low intensity environments. And you, you posted a really good comment there. I wondered if you could just uh, share that with us for a moment. Yes, uh, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting discussion. Those of us that were in the previous sessions are definitely getting a more holistic picture on the overall themes. Um, I actually have a couple of questions, but I'll start with the first one. I'll just read off from what I put in the chat, which is essentially that uh, you both mentioned the separation of tasks under the UN model. And uh, of course, civil is such a wide 
topic uh, and depending upon who you talk to, people have different understandings of it. And um, I recently finished my research looking at the smaller project which the military deploys um, if I can use a strong word uh, to say where it essentially behaves and does the kinds of things that a humanitarian and development NGO would do. Um, and it does those projects in order to gain access and placement to better understand the context in which it's operating. Of course, everyone here that has had involvement with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan would know that uh, there was a huge effort under um, the conventional military doing this sort of work in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it, it's, it's left a lot of negative thinking around the military's engagement uh, in that space. But still today, um, DOD has an entire budget line that it dedicates to this, the disaster response and complex emergency stuff you talked about on your scale, but also these tiny small projects that it does literally worldwide. And my question is, um, how do you navigate um, essentially the challenges you come across when there is no coordination for these projects because they're purely done for security purposes. Uh, yet, if I always say, you know, if you are 200 miles away from the embassy in a small village out there where there is no, there is no huge international presence, everyone knows that things in the field look very different than they do in the capital, a soldier carrying out humanitarian and development activities essentially becomes the humanitarian and development actor in the eyes of the local community. So how do you navigate that and, and keep those areas separated from the multilateral effort versus the what's clearly a just execution of foreign policy effort? Great. Um, there was a question here by Nasir who has been with us since the beginning of this, uh, with regard to UN, UN OCHA monitoring of the uh, humanitarian situation in Ukraine. I wondered if, uh, if Dominique, you could just uh, uh, give us a quick uh, idea what, on how that is. Uh, yeah, sure, just maybe to reply to Stanislava's excellent question. I mean, the, the projects you're referring to are, are, we call them quick quips, quick impact projects that the forces uh, usually have a budget line for. Um, it's, it, is, uh, it is a point of concern for humanitarians because it risks blurring the lines between what is military, what is an action that has, that is in pursuit of military objectives and what is actions that are not. Um, and there are two ways that we, we try and address this. One is from the bottom up, and I think Stuart's going to speak to this a little bit more from his recent experience in Mali. But the UN has developed policy guidelines on managing quips, and the imperative to coordinate with humanitarian actors is written black on white in that policy guidance that is mandatory. And we've established local project review committees, LPRCs, in mission contexts, where OCHA represents the humanitarian community, these QUIP proposals are presented and we can basically make sure that whatever is proposed, if it goes ahead, it is not in duplication of an effort we do not see any uh, negative repercussions for the humanitarian action. And we basically have a dialogue on this. And where we think there is already a humanitarian response happening and that this is not the best use of, of the means, we try and find solutions together with the force to find something you know, else that the force can engage with that would not have a negative effect on the community or the, the, the humanitarian response. Uh, again, this premises on sound dialogue understanding each other and that's where the top-down aspect comes in it's through continuous engagement training dialogue at all levels to make sure that all sides understand you know why there is a reason why humanitarian efforts should be kept distinct from military efforts we understand the need to win hearts and minds but there are ways of doing that that doesn't compromise above all, the very safety of the communities we're trying all to assist. I hope that answers the uh, the question. I don't know, Stephanie, if you want to add anything to that, because we had some memorable meetings there at the LPRCs. <laughs> Uh, I think the only thing that I would uh, compliment what Dominique just said is that in, in the United Nations, I think, you know, we talk about quips. Uh, Mali also had a trust fund 
which was something very, very different because that trust fund fell underneath the purview of the SRSG in that mission. So there was another bot or another pot of money for quip like projects, but they weren't really quips because they were sitting underneath this trust fund. So those are just some of the, the different ways that the UN or the different I, you know, I say when I say the different ways that the UN has um, the ability to do some of these, you know, projects, uh, whatever they are, um, sometimes those lines do get blurred quite a bit. Um, another thing that uh, that happened while we were in Mali is um, we have a lot of nations out there, and some of them come with their own national agenda, and some of the contingents were handing out. Um, things, I'm just going to say things, um, to the local population that had the nation uh, written on the side of that, um, you know, whatever it was, soccer ball, pencil, you name it. Um, but it did not say you went on it. And, and we had to be very, very careful because that is, that has the potential of reputational risk for the United Nations if something were to happen. Um, so these, these are just some of the, the different layers of, of what is going, uh, what is happening inside of the, of the UN kind of ecosystem, I guess. Um, and, and Dominique, I, I know one of the questions here was, um, about OCHA taking a look at Ukraine. Um, the way I understand it, OCHA is the entity um, charged or chartered with making sure that humanitarian efforts, efforts are coordinated across the world. Um, and I know that um, you and your team provided me a very uh, interesting, it blew my mind, uh, update on what was happening in Ukraine um, from your perspective um, in, in trying to organize that. So the, the short answer to that is yes, absolutely. OCHA is involved with what's happening in Ukraine. Um, I don't want to speak for you, Dominic. Over to you. No, no, uh, absolutely. So OCHA's response in Ukraine uh, has, has a number of uh, aspects. The first one is what we're doing in the country. So in Ukraine, coordinating the, the relief efforts that are happening for the population that is still in Ukraine. Anything that is happening outside of Ukraine, and that means the refugee flows to Western or Central Europe or the, um, the relocations that happen towards uh, Russia, that is beyond the remit of OCHA and usually falls under the remit of HCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees. We try and have a dialogue with them and, and keep uh, uh, an overview of what is happening uh, because OCHA also has a, a broader protection of civilians mandate. Uh, we are the ones who author the annual Secretary General's report on the protection of civilians, which is a really important resource document. I'll, I'll post that in the, the chat, the last iteration of that one. So we keep an overview of what is happening in the third countries, but our focus in the Ukraine effort is within Ukraine. Um, we have a presence in Moscow uh, to basically keep the uh, Russian uh, military and, and defense uh, stakeholders informed of humanitarian movements that might, um, uh, whose security might be impacted by Russian military operations with a view to safeguard uh, humanitarian personnel and assets through the humanitarian notification system. So that is the level and extent of our dialogue with Moscow at the moment, notwithstanding, of course, the high level engagement that is done at the highest senior, most senior level uh, of our Undersecretary General Martin Griffiths, who has regular dialogue and, and advocates for the respect for international humanitarian law with all sides uh, of the context. So I hope that answers your question. I'm happy to put in the chat our resource page from OCHA Ukraine, where you have um, all available information uh, pertaining to the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. Okay, we've got a lot of great questions here, and uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to lift and shift over to uh, our other presenters so we can make sure we give them some time. Uh, I know there are some questions in the chat room, and, and Dominique and Stephanie, if you could take a look at those and maybe respond to them. Uh, there, I would so much appreciate it. Stu, I know you've got some contributions from where you are. I wondered if you could just wrap those into your, at the beginning of your presentation, and just make some comments there. Uh, but I'd like to bring Stefan up and see if we can talk about NATO. 
and, and thank you both, uh, Dominique and Stephanie, for uh, contributing today. And thank you so much for your service to Pete. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all. Um, we'll be adding our email addresses so you can reach out also bilaterally. Thank you. I hope you don't mind if I stay online a little while longer. Of course, no, absolutely, absolutely. So Chris, it's my turn. Yes, sir, it is, go for it. Yeah, I will try to share my screen. Got it. All right, uh, this will not be a repetition of uh, yesterday's workshop, um, but a bit more specific. Uh, Chris, I'm grateful that you already um, yeah, copied some, some of the relevant uh, phrases out of the new uh, NATO strategic concept. Um, I want to be a bit more specific um, with how do we as a CIMIC Center of Excellence see the contribution of NATO CIMIC to uh, winning without fighting. Um, again, it's not a repetition from yesterday, but I want to start uh, with um, the definition that is really um, the key, key terminology that also sets the framework. And I want to draw your attention um, to the two um, uh, included key activities for CIMIC in this definition. The one is understanding the, the integration of the understanding of the civil factors of the operating environment. And the second is enablement, facilitation, and the conduct of civil military interaction. And um, at the ending of the definition, you see in peacetime crisis and conflict. And this is exactly where we are right now uh, when we say without fighting. So civil military action, just for the completeness and for those who haven't uh, seen the workshop yesterday, are the activities between NATO military bodies and non-military actors uh, to foster mutual understanding and uh, that enhance effectiveness and efficiency in crisis management, conflict prevention, and resolution. Um, still, the ending of the sentence here is a bit different. Uh, it's a result of uh, 30 nations uh, negotiating about it and uh, different allies having different opinions. That was not the original uh, draft that we handed in. Nevertheless, I think we can live with it as uh, conflict prevention is also before uh, fighting. <clears throat> In the NATO warfighting capstone concept, which is a concept that um, is the North Star for the Alliance for the next 20 years, how uh, NATO has to develop uh, the warfighting capabilities and, and warfare. Um, we, talk, we talk about um, three uh, strategic and operational contexts, and this is shape, contest, and fight. If we today talk about winning without fighting, I think we will focus on the phases or, or the um, context, shape, and contest valid for all um, those contexts are the attribution, the so-called the six outs. This is the ambition uh, that NATO wants to achieve. We want to outthink, outexcel, outfight, outlast, outpace, and outpartner our adversaries. And um, as you can imagine, I can see a role uh, for CIMIC in some of those uh, attributions, um, as I will show you uh, on the following slides. But just to uh, for the for the uh, completion of uh, the contexts in the shape and contest contexts, uh, especially in the shape, 
you can see in the first bullet um, a situation where NATO is setting the conditions and now really interesting through a combination of different instruments of power across the whole dime spectrum. So already here uh, we have military and non-military um, yeah, instruments of power uh, coordinated and synchronized in the so-called uh, comprehensive approach. For me, um, this is a task for, yeah, not only for the semicons, for the J9, but for the commanders and for all advisors and the whole staff to properly execute um, the uh, um, joint function CIMIC uh, appropriately in order to enable that this is uh, the, the military contribution to this comprehensive approach is uh, most efficient and most effective. As when you look at the contest context, you also see that there is um, adversaries are, are challenging us as an alliance or individual allies in one or several domains, primarily by non-military means and below the threshold of armed conflicts, still without fighting. But especially in this uh, context, uh, it is super important um, that we can provide a proper integration and understanding of the civil factors of the operating environment. Now, when you see the six outs, um, I, I think when you read what is behind those um, terms, you uh, will, will easily identify the ones where uh, we can see uh, the uh, yeah, NATO, NATO's role in it. And the, the first one is um, outthink, improve the understanding of the evolving battle space. And as we know in uh, the modern battle space, or you can also call it operating environment, um, the, the lines between civil environment and, and military um, environment are, are blurring and there are interdependencies which, um, which make it necessary to, to look at it comprehensively and uh, the role of, of CIMIC analysis and assessment, uh, we will call it civil factor integration, um, will be a, a significant contribution in order to enable the alliance to outthink the adversaries. The next one is um, outlast. When you read it um, during competition, operate in contest environments and develop resilience of military force and civil society. Here, the, the link to the civil society, this is where um, CIMIC is a sensor to be able to um, yeah, understand um, the resilience of the civil society and on the other hand, uh, uh, be a, a non-lethal effector and uh, a coordinator to increase the uh, resilience of the civil society. And uh, last but not least, I think uh, our partner. Um, again, here we have uh, the other instruments of power named, uh, which is definitely, um, uh, uh, yeah, they are non-military and by that it's a CIMIC task. So um, below the political level, uh, for NATO, that's yeah. As soon as it's, uh, it becomes uh, military strategic, so on a shape level, all NATO operations are um, by definition then uh, conducted uh, uh, by the military instrument of power, and um, uh, the 
the harmonization with uh, counterparts below the political level on that level shape and below um, is is a simic task and um, this is really uh, where, why we see the, the two core activities that are um, included in the in the new definition for simic the uh, civil factor integration and uh, civil military interaction are where are and will be the the contribution of uh, NATO CIMIC to uh, winning without fighting? And again, uh, I forgot to stress that yesterday uh, appropriately, it requires it requires a real capability development. Uh, we have a, a significant gap here in the analysis and assessment uh, capability for the civil environment. This is where we where we try to uh, put our focus on when it comes to capability development support from the CIMIC Center of Excellence side. It's uh, highly appreciated uh, and, and in direct support of a strategic initiative uh, from Shape Nine. We think we are we are on a good track. And uh, let me uh, make a quick comment uh, to my uh, UN colleagues uh, that were speaking and presenting uh, before me. Um, not sure, or I'm not aware that you have seen the presentation yesterday, but if you look at the uh, uh, CMI uh, establishments uh, that we foresee, um, uh, they are very similar to what you have presented uh, with regard to your liaison arrangements uh, in, the, in the UN CIMIC doctrine. So I think we are, uh, at least in that point, uh, quite well aligned. So um, now we, we are very often asked uh, about effects uh, that um, CIMIC can achieve in support of um, um, yeah, the victory, to, to secure the victory. And um, I, I just want to name a, a few of them. CIMIC uh, ensures the effective uh, military contribution to a comprehensive approach, as the comprehensive approach itself is developed and implemented on the political level, but the military the successful military contribution to it, that's a, a CIMIC task. We increase the effectiveness and efficiency of military and non-military activities. Um, by that, we save combat power for the forces. And uh, also, last but not least, we ensure and maximize uh, the protection of civilians and the military contribution uh, to human security in operations. Um, so I think um, it is, it, it, might seem a bit simplistic this approach, but um, yeah, um, as an army guy, um, keep it uh, stupid simple or simple stupid. Help me out. Um, I think this is this is how we should approach this. Uh, not overcomplicated and and really refocus on on the two uh, core activities and make it uh, two core competencies so that the J9 is the subject matter expert for the commander when it comes to the civil environment and when it comes to civil military interaction uh, as the J2 is uh, for the enemy situation. This is what we are aiming for and this is how we see um, CIMIC as a joint function and CIMIC as a staff function and by that capability uh, to contribute to, to winning without fighting. Uh, transferring that to the warfare development imperatives. Um, sorry for those uh, fancy words, but they are uh, originally uh, put from the NATO warfighting capstone concept. And, and um, these are the... Uh, um, concluded imperatives. NATO strives for 
cognitive superiority, our point of view, uh, if you want to achieve superiority, you have to have at least a proper understanding of your operating environment. And by that, uh, we, we contribute. Uh, you can argue about influence and power projection uh, with a bit of fantasy. You, you can uh, um, link CIMIC to, to influence, but I, I think influence uh, implies uh, that, that we're talking about the target audience and not about um, neutral and, and, and friendly uh, non-military actors uh, that we meet with uh, transparency and, and trust. So I would exclude that and, and would focus on the, on the last one, the, the layered resilience, uh, where we really contribute. Layered resilience consists of two layers, military resilience and civil resilience and the interdependencies. And this is where, where CIMIC uh, comes into the game when we talk about civil resilience and the interdependencies to the military resilience. Um, the cross-cutting enablers, um, for, from, from a CIMIC perspective, uh, the fourth one, day zero integration is, is really crucial. Uh, NATO CIMIC is uh, limited with current policy um, uh, under, under political caveat, and uh, as it looks at the moment, uh, one ally will insist on that in the new CIMIC policy that is uh, in, the, in the approval process. Um, that, that is really a, a decisive um, caveat and, and limitation for NATO CIMIC uh, to be to be successful, to work for a, a day zero integration, or to be to be limited in, in uh, effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, that was my uh, short overview. And uh, Chris, I hope I, I met your expectations and I'm open for questions. You, you always meet our expectations, sir. And thank you very much for uh, doing double duty this week. Uh, yesterday and today, we much appreciate your contribution. I wondered if if you could just for a moment, uh, and this is my question, and then there's another question or two on the, in the chat room. I wondered if you could just elaborate a little bit about how uh, the CCOE is taking a look at cognitive warfare and you know this merging concept of cognitive warfare and how the CCOE is 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 envisioning the role of CIMIC in cognitive war. Good question. Thank you, uh, sir. Um, so NATO is currently drafting a, a concept, or ACT is drafting a concept um, for, for cognitive warfare. We are contributing to this. Um, we see some limitations in that as um, CIMIC will not be uh, a joint function or an asset. Um, CIMIC capabilities will not or shall not be used um, in, in offensive cognitive warfare. But we see a role of CIMIC in protecting our population from offensive cognitive warfare measures of our adversaries. And um, I think this is a prerequisite to, to keep and maintain um, the trust-based relationship that we have to our non-military actors, uh, neutral and friendly non-military actors. Okay. And um, I would say it's, it's a bit uh, premature to, to be more specific, but uh, I hope that, that gives an idea of, of where we see where we see the role and the, the limitation for CIMIC. We would look forward to in the, in the future, maybe in the spring when we do the round table, the discussion of, of that in a deeper sense, because I think we would, we would in the civil affairs community learn an awful lot from what you're uh, uh, discovering about this. Of course, ACT is in Norfolk, Virginia. Yeah. And, um, and I know that we have some conversations going on with them on the level of cognitive warfare. But the, the CA CIMIC role in this, I think, needs to be 
much better developed and defined. And I think with your kind of going down that road uh, a little early, maybe we could uh, we could uh, share our experiences on that. So I would look forward to that in the, in the spring. Yeah, and and maybe I can make an, an add on. And, and say that uh, we, are, we are fully aware that um, individual allies uh, might develop um, offensive cognitive warfare capabilities and might apply them. But as we see it right now, this will not uh, be, uh, uh, there won't be NATO capabilities uh, in, in the uh, NATO command structure um, under, under permanent uh, NATO control that, that there, there won't be, we, we don't see any uh, offensive cognitive warfare capabilities so far. Gotcha. So um, uh, th that's maybe, I, I think it's, it's a, a fair statement or a serious um, a guess when, when I say probably the United States of America will be one of the allies who, who will be able to apply offensive cognitive. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be surprised include, either. <laughs> yeah, so, by that include uh, maybe civil affairs, but not civic. That might be one of the fields again where our mandates might differ a little bit. Yeah, and um, I, I, I will be. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm happy to to share whatever we have and to, uh, yeah, not to stress that we are different, but just to identify where where uh, the mandates. Uh, no, but we also need to understand where we can work together and where we, we shouldn't work together so that we can, as, as I say, get together in order to stay out of each other's way. <laughs> um, if I could, Brian Murray, um, could you come up on the net and, uh, and ask your question? Sir, I like the uh, presentation about the, uh, the six outs. I was just wondering, as you guys teach it and talk it amongst partners and, and just professionals, would there be utility in moving the way you list some of those principles since you're trying to win without fighting? And does it make sense to move out fight and out last to some of the last principles you talk about? So you spend your energy and time learning, focusing on, you know, the other methods of competition short of conflict since that's your end state. But I'm, I'm really sorry. And I, I could say there were technical problems, but I think I have a cognitive problem. It, could you could you re uh, repeat or maybe rephrase your question? Um, in the in the way you lay out the, the six outs, um, yeah. is there utility in adjusting the way you present them so your uh, outlast and outflight are the last two elements to shift people's thoughts to being more about um, the first element um, in competition versus uh, the fighting or outlasting? You know the more um, military dynamic nature of, of war. So you, you're saying that the the sequence uh, in which I presented the outs was misleading? No, I was just saying, is there utility as you discuss it as professionals in teaching and coaching it um, and, and just reframing where it goes and you guys not really see that as, a, as an issue in discussion? Um, I'm having a little difficulty too understanding what, what you're trying to say, Brian. Uh, uh, make it simple. Simplify your English. Are you proposing to change the sequence or are you proposing to, to, to change the explanations? Um, of the outs or, or what, what? No, just, yeah, just changing the sequencing of how you present it. Um, so you focus more on the, the first four elements in your planning and processing and execution. Okay. So you're giving feedback on on how they how they prioritize. All right. So um, I don't think that the sequence was a, a prioritization. Um, I haven't, um, yeah, questioned or or thought about uh, if there is an implied prioritization in the sequence. Um, and, but I agree that the, 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 the out fight, um, yeah, might imply that if, if it's implied that there is a sequence in it, then we are a bit quick in fight and, and maybe with the out partner a bit late. So if you try to put it in a sequence, I also would, would see uh, 
our partner uh, uh, first. And um, um, therefore, yeah, it's it's not my it's not my call. It's a, it's an ACT uh, document, but um, I will make a note and and uh, forward forward that idea of a possible possible wrong implications uh, with that sequence. If I may, um, Stefan, I think maybe what Brian's trying to get to there is what we call what we call the continuum or the competition competition continuum or the spectrum of conflict. If you yeah. start on one side with uh, with pre conflict and then you know go to post conflict or return to peace or return to competition or whatever, maybe that's what he's suggesting is that it's sort of along the operational continuum. It's sort of more logically presented. I think that's what he's. Let's move on. Um, Leon, uh, uh, Leonard, I'm sorry. Um, would you like to ask your question about uh, FM3-57? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Leonard Casipe. I'm founder of the Public Value LLC. I'm a former Green Beret and a former psychological operations, currently in a doctorate program for law and policy. My question is regarding for US-based operations, uh, during the transition to military authority, it's uh, FM uh, Field Manual 3-57, which is the Civil Oper Operations Manual. And then it transitions over to Peace, Opera Peace Operations, which is ATP 3-07.31. And then uh, but for the, the National Security Presidential Directive, NSPD 44, the state Secretary of State or the Department of State is becomes the lead for all transition activities. And I wanted to know, and that's for the US, I wanted to know what agency or which which organization becomes that the same level of the as the Secretary of State, Department of State when it comes to transition activities when, it, when NATO is involved, sir. Thank you. So I got, I understood that this question was directed towards the US. Oh, oh anyone on, on I, in the forum? Let me, let me try, let me try to answer this if I can, uh, Stefan. I think I understand what his question is. I think what, Leonard, I think what you've got to understand is you are speaking from the perspective of a unilateral actor. Okay. With, with agency, there is no State Department in, the, in there. There's no foreign ministry in there. It's a multi. It's a multinational command, just like the UN is a multinational organization. However, what's I think really super important in both in the C. If you look at the CMI document that I posted on on civil military interaction, uh, and even the CIMIC doctrine, and even the CIMIC doctrine, what you will see very plainly and very clearly is that. The, the strategic direction for, for both the United Nations uh, and NATO civil military concepts and operations is always the civilian authority, always. The military is never, ever in the lead of anything. It takes very clear and, and uh, direct, strategic direction um, uh, from the, uh, for example, the, in in in, uh, in the United Nations, from the, in the field mission and the operational level, uh, or the, the, the country's strategic level, um, the the special representative, the Secretary General, who is like the ambassador, he has he directly represents the UN Secretary General. He he or she is the person that it is the utmost authority in, in that. And, and the force commander always answers to the SRSG. Um, they, they, the UN Integrated Field Mission actually is an ex exceptional model for interagency uh, operational level coordination. And they've been at this for well over 20 years now, perfecting the model. There's actually a, a National Defense University study that was done a few years back on this on, on how uh, uh, how that model may be applied 
uh, uh, when we do civil military integration and civil military uh, uh, prioritization and so on uh, in, in at the theater strategic or, or at the country team level. But it's, it's the same kind of concept. So um, the, 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 lead, all, the, the, the lead agency is always civilian in, in, in the UN and NATO. That's your short answer. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, any other questions? Who manages the CIMIC inter Jeffrey, your, your question, who manages the CIMIC interface between NATO forces and host nation civilian actors? If you could answer that, Stefan, fairly quickly. The interface between NATO and host nation non-military actors uh, depends very much on uh, the regulations and and uh, the um, yeah the, the rules uh, within the host nation. So um, there are host nations that are a, a bit more permissive uh, towards uh, a direct link between NATO uh, force elements or, or NATO headquarters. Um, uh, communicating with non-military actors, and there are uh, allies that are more restrictive. But as a as a thumb rule, I would say the the, the standard setup uh, in a functioning so so not conquered but still fully functioning uh, allied nation is that NATO goes via um, the NATO CIMIC goes via host nation CIMIC. So the J9 talks to the J9 who has the contact with the non-military actor. That's the, the standard, the default setting for that. Over. Okay, um, I know we've got a couple more questions, uh, but I'm gonna have to move on uh, so that I can get uh, uh, Dave uh, in and then Stu, and we're gonna have to wrap this up at 11, 20, or 12, 25 at the latest. So uh, let's see if we can get these uh, presenters some You got it. You see that okay? Yes, sir, I can see it. Yeah, hi, I, sh I shall keep my remarks uh, quite brief, really, to give um, Stuart and Marley plenty of time, uh, but also because I'm on my third bout of COVID and uh, there's a real chance I could spend my entire time coughing. Um, so I shall do my best, uh, but I think it's important to give Stuart plenty of time. Is, see whether the slide is advancing. Really, all I'm just going to give is a very brief overview of our new capstone UK defence doctrine, uh, partly because clearly fighting without winning is not our preferred course of action. Um, and also UK land forces in particular are at their smallest uh, since we just defeated Napoleon. And in reality, when you want to integrate across the world, some form of mass matters. And the only way you can create rat mass, if you haven't got it in reality, is to do it artificially. Uh, and integration is one way of creating the effect of uh, engagement across a wide area. So our new doctrine, which came out last week, uh, basically describes how policy and national security uh, are really moved together in using instruments of power or the, in the DIME approach, uh, integrated and a, an intergovernmental integrated approach, which we call the fusion doctrine uh, cross government. Integrated action is the, the military part of the integrated approach for the UK. And it's really about how we focus on the audiences, uh, not just the adversary, across all the operational domains, uh, but critically synchronized with those non-military activities. Uh, to really influence attitudes and behaviours and really deciding what those successful outcomes may be. Clearly, what defines success will be a political drive. But part of the problem you have with a lot of engagement is there is no idea or definition of what actually success looks like. 
one way of looking at this is rather than looking at conflict uh, across the continuum is we use the integrated operating framework, which is outlined in the UK defense doctrine. And it talks about the functions of protect, engage, constrain, and at the ex extreme war fight. But that's not necessarily means you go log you go systematically from one to another to another is you do all of these activities at the same time and potentially in the same space. And you see under there our land operational themes, which is our lower level doctrine uh, from homeland resilience, humanitarian disaster relief, engagement, peace support and stabilization, irregular warfare and conventional warfare. And the reality is these again are not sequential. Um, in the same operational space, you could be conducting all of those activities. And certainly uh, with world events at the moment, pretty much everything short of conventional warfare is actually going on at the same time and in the same space. So the criticality of that is actually it's all about balance between the different levers of power, who has a greater influence. Um, but as Chris said, is the military will always be in a supporting role. We're very, we're not going to be in the lead role in any of these decisions, even in conventional war fighting, the decision will be a political one that we're in support of. But it's about trying to achieve the greatest effect uh, so you don't actually have to get to the war fight. Um, Constrain is the most proactive and assertive short, short of war fighting, but that could involve the use of force, particularly on the periphery. And our role of outreach, and I put in brackets CIMIC forces, because our outreach forces are not exactly the same as CIMIC NATO forces. Uh, and as Stefan said, is different nations have slightly different um, definitions of what its civil military forces do. Um, our outreach forces do slightly more than CIMIC in NATO definition terms, although we do quite a lot of that. So there is a big overlap. But really within our capstone doctrine is one of the critical roles is um, of outreach forces is developing insight to develop comprehension. Uh, comprehension is wider than understand. Uh, understanding is really focused on an adversary or um, an enemy. Comprehension is about understanding the entire environment, including how you change it just by being within it. And critical role of the outreach is actually um, building those relationships so that integrated action can occur, can occur across partners. Because actually, it's no good having integrated action just within the UK. You have to have it across allies and partners as well, because that creates the multiplier effect. One of the critical roles of our outreach forces as well is um, understanding the non-digital aspects of the information environment. So our outreach forces are part of our information forces uh, in many ways. Uh, and actually an awful lot of the information environment is not digital. Uh, a lot of people will equate the information environment to the internet and it's pure virtual space, but actually people and how they communicate uh, in non-digital aspects is just as important. And one of the main underlying themes that sits in our capstone doctrine and is covered in our UK um, JSP 985 policy is the role of human security, uh, because rather than focusing purely on institutionals, institutions providing security, human security is the bottom up security that actually can meet institutional security at the same time. So I mentioned about outreach in the information environment. So the information environment exists in the physical space, the cognitive space, and the informational space. And outreach are a real critical part of participating so that all we have a full comprehension of the information environment. And um, particularly in that coordination, engagement, influence, reassuring and communicate is a critical role of our outreach forces. Some of that will be very CIMIC focus. Some of it will be more supporting our wider information efforts. 
and I touched on purely uh, on human security. So human security exists within UK defence doctrine, our capstone doctrine, which means it is a consideration, all the subordinate doctrine down from the strategic to the tactical level. And JSP 985, which uh, there should be a link to it within the chat, um, is our policy. So it's in our doctrine. And this is, a, this is the policy on how we actually apply it. And critical to that is it's an essential part of our legitimacy uh, because without legitimacy internationally is it undermines what we're doing. So human security is part of our building a competitive, compelling narrative uh, to evoke legitimacy on whatever we're doing. And you see the cross-cutting themes, uh, which are very similar to the NATO cross-cutting themes, uh, but also uh, uh, within the United Nations. And all these, none of these things operate in a vacuum. They're all intertwined together and human security and wider security are inexplicably linked. And that's recognized in our doctrine and in our national policy. So really, just to wrap that up, the UK military approach to winning without fighting, really the civil military networks are essential to enabling that comprehension and delivering integrated action. Because if we can't understand the impact we're having, we don't understand uh, what we're doing within that environment, particularly how we're, we're impacting on it, is it's just not gonna have the effect that we need it. So outreach forces uh, within the UK exist with, uh, as, as part of our operations in the information environment. So they are informational forces. Uh, so it's slightly different from just uh, coordination. It's actually trying to deliver effect as well. Uh, but particularly human security is increasingly being recognized um, and is important to begin uh, delivering the sort of stability that stops the actual war starting in the first place. Because if we're fighting is everything else that's gone before that has failed in some way. Um, and that's really just my very quick remarks. And if anybody's got any questions. I, I don't see any in the chat room. Uh, I posted the, the joint uh, concept. Uh, so you don't even have to go to the, the, the link for you there. So you can download it. Anyone else? Dave, thanks very much. And I didn't realize that you were uh, dealing with your third bout of COVID. And yeah, uh, yeah, thanks I, I, very much. Yeah, I, I did get it before uh, it Diana's was trending. Diana's hand is up, I think. Diana, yeah, I think Parsons someone. Then. Diana, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Diana. I think there is a question in the chat about uh, human security legitimacy um, um, as a potential avenue. Um, and I'm, I would say, yes, that's certainly the, the thoughts, uh, the thinking behind the UK, because if you've got legitimacy uh, and which derives from human security, uh, it, it can be countering hostile states and also violent extremist organizations, because it's, a, it's basically about a compelling narrative, regardless of who it's targeted at. Um, so it's certainly the thinking that underlies UK doctrine, uh, and I think on our own national security strategy as well. So, you know, I'd absolutely endorse that sort of link. Great. Diana, just circling back to you, did, did you, you're, you're unmuted, I believe. So go ahead and ask your question. Not able to, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, um, let's move on to uh, Stu. Stu, you're up, sir. Okay, let's see if I can get this uh, screen sharing to work. And, and and again, thank you. I don't know what time it is out there. Uh, um, it's not too bad, it's only five. It's five gotta be, I was gonna say about six in the afternoon, something like that, okay. You're in Bamako, right? I am, yeah. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and simplify things. If you can't so, share your your presentation, I've got it here, so I can get it up on the uh, thing, and you'll just do a slide flip it. Uh, yeah, do you, if you want to pull it up, that might be the fastest. Sorry, I don't want to waste people's time. Um, I will try and be as quick as I can because I think we have about 15 minutes and I want to leave time for questions. And so I don't know how much I'll actually rely on, on my presentation to try and be brief. So a quick bit of where I'm coming from. So uh, my name is Major Thomas. I work for the Influence Activities Task Force in Canada, which is the home to Canada's only full-time and PSYOPs capability. So a bit similar to the UK, where they have kind of their CIMIC and PSYOPs housed in, in one unit, uh, we are the same. Uh, and so I personally am cross-trained InfoOps, PSYOPs, and CIMIC, but my original background is in uh, light infantry. Uh, I was deployed as part, if we just want to skip to next slide, and we'll just get right to, the, I think, the third slide. Go past the overview, keep going. Keep going because we're tracking that. Perfect. We'll hold here. So I was deployed uh, back one, please. Uh, so I was deployed as part of a Canadian reconnaissance team to Poland to respond to the uh, anticipated humanitarian disaster in in Poland. And and I, the reason I say anticipated is because quite quite frankly, the national response to the uh, giant influx of Ukrainian refugees. The numbers are on the slide. Uh, was absolutely fantastic, phenomenal, uh, and actually resulted in, in in very little need for military response. And so what I want to do, just using this slide primarily, is to walk kind of through the response phases here and, and what doctrine and policy would say should happen and then what actually happened. And so as briefed by OCHA and, and the UN side, you know, military humanitarian activities are supposed to be a last resort, a third responder, if you will, or even fourth responder. The Reality of it is governments have strategic messages they want to send, and so they will deploy military capabilities as a national asset in, to, to basically achieve an informational or strategic communications effect. And that is certainly uh, what Canada did, and I would argue, uh, at least in my opinion, that's what the Americans did as well with their deployment uh, into Poland. And so what were the so what's on the cognitive front? So. If we look at winning without fighting, you had a massive military threat to Europe writ large, and the NATO and bilateral NATO member countries' response was to try and pre-patch uh, seams that were going to be potentially open within the alliance. And so with NATO facing a disproportionate burden from the Ukrainian refugees, the national responses were to provide military and non-military assistance into both Poland uh, as, as well as Ukraine, obviously. And so we were part of that. Uh, next slide. And so the Canadian footprint is really quite tiny. Uh, we were based mostly in the, the city of Warsaw itself. And then I uh, spent quite a lot of time in uh, Zhejiao, and I'll speak more of that in a second. Uh, and next slide. And then the component of this was a very ad hoc. So based on the recce report, we kind of shaped a rough force. Uh, it wasn't very large, but what I really want to flag here is that we had a fairly robust percentage of the force that was CIMIC. So we had uh, seven CIMIC uh, personnel, uh, myself, a master warrant officer, so an E7, I believe, uh, and then uh, five tactical CIMIC operators. And as a percentage of the force, we were almost, you know, pushing on uh, almost 10%. And uh, what that allowed us to do, next slide. Uh, next slide. was to facilitate a significant amount of coordination on the forces behalf. And so, as I said, I was in Zhejiao. Zhejiao became the hub for humanitarian coordination and military support coordination into Ukraine. So almost all, all the news we were reading about military resources being donated to Ukraine, almost all of that was coming into Zhejiao and from there over the Polish border into Ukraine. Uh, as a result, most of the military actors had representation, including NATO direct, uh, inside of that hub. Uh, additionally, OCHA had established their hub for coordination of activities uh, in Zhejiao as well. And so that shifted as the disaster uh, 
became, or the crisis and security environment in Lviv and Kyiv changed. OCHA pushed further forward, but initially they were co-located in, uh, in Zhejiang. And so as a result, by being there, we were able to plug into quite a few organizations uh, in that location. And I'll talk a little bit more about the coordination mechanisms that happened there, because uh, US civil affairs, I think, were really quite cutting edge. Uh, and it's worth taking a quick moment to talk about. Uh, next slide. Uh, in Warsaw is where we really did the CIMIC role of support to the force. So my team in Warsaw were the ones really advising the task force commander our, at the government level as well, providing advice on how the government of Canada. So you see IRCC, that's our immigration and refugee office that we're doing the screening of all the refugees to bring back to Canada. And so the CIMIC teams there were, were directly coordinating the information flow between quite a few organizations and providing that kind of technical advice to, to the commander himself. Next slide. And so these were all the various points of combat, uh, sorry, contact those guys, uh, CIMIC operators had. And through these the organizations, they were able to provide early warning on issues. So as the reception centers began to open or close, the first capability that knew about it every time was, was my CIMIC teams. And so they were the ones able to provide the ground force commanders and the team leaders with that advance warning, because obviously there's an impact to the force if the people they're supporting are, are leaving. Next slide. So yeah, so here's where we get to kind of the meat. So this is a slide I built within a week of being in theater, uh, which ended up getting briefed at the Polish strategic command level. Uh, and the reason I, I kind of emphasize that is this was me hastily trying to create a liaison framework uh, to answer some of the questions that were brought up earlier in this, uh, this meeting, which is how do all of the various military components, humanitarian components, uh, integrate and coordinate uh, inside of a fully established sovereign state? So much of our NATO experience and national experiences in the CIMIC environment are supporting failed states or states that are completely overwhelmed and overcome with events. And that is simply not the reality in Poland. And, and actually I would argue in Ukraine. So even in Ukraine, I think it was asked earlier about the coordination mechanisms. Uh, while I was there, the hands down, the leader on where humanitarian assistance went, where resources were directed, it was 100% the government of Ukraine that was coordinating and directing all of that. And obviously they can't tell humanitarians what to do, but they were certainly the, uh, the convening authority for those types of uh, activities and providing quite a lot of the information and logistical support that directed that. And there are, there are some con constraints to that as a result of that, but I would definitely say both in Ukraine and in Poland, it was the state that played an active role. And this is a mixed blessing. The, the blessing being, it, it indicates that you then have the nation state resources supporting the crisis, the downside being we're kind of used to being more in charge and we're used to having more directing capability of being able to say where troops go, how they go, what they can do when they can get there. And that simply was not the case in Poland. And so to the specific question on who coordinated between our, our CIMIC capabilities and the U.S. CIMIC capabilities and local government and humanitarian organizations, the answer was Polish CIMIC and Polish military. So we would be attached and patrol or go and conduct meetings in collaboration with our Polish counterparts. And so there ended up being kind of this, you know, I think we would use like the green force in front with us supporting uh, and that support role could transition from a leadership to a, to a support depending on the capabilities on the ground. The other key distinction is that while OCHA is the lead uh, for humanitarian operations inside of uh, Poland proper, uh, UNHCR was the lead organization. And so even some kind of basic nomenclature. So I had to shift from things like cluster systems. Uh, that's not that's not what they use over there. They use this. They have this refugee coordination forum and then they have sectors underneath that. Essentially the same thing, just slightly different language. Uh, and so those are all in place. Next slide. So this is what this organization was supposed to look like in theory. By the time we had the framework roughly identified, the need for it had diminished, as we saw in the, one of the in the, one of the first slides. The Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, dropped very, very quickly, and we had a pretty consistent capability to manage it. Uh, the Poland had the capability to manage it. And so there really wasn't the need for this, uh, this complex kind of multinational, multi-sector uh, representation. But this was the framework that essentially all parties agreed to, to activate, to provide that coordination mechanism. 
And so that's that's how I would say, in theory, humanitarian military humanitarian operations would have been coordinated on a large scale. Next slide. Uh, what happened in place of that and on the early onset was Task Force 82 very quickly came in and realized there was an absolute ton of stakeholders, entities uh, that needed very basic situational updates uh, that they were very capable of providing because they were plugged into the uh, U.S. intelligence collection uh, capabilities as well as the U.S. state uh, apparatus to provide kind of that general update onto what the status and stuff was going on. And so they established what they what they called a community of interest. And I think this is a really key takeaway from terms of lessons learned in frameworks. And so my simplest language for this is it's essentially a cluster meeting for all sectors that the task force commander himself chaired. U.S. Civil Affairs did the legwork and provided the IT infrastructure for it, and then was supported by uh, donors. And by that, I mean state funders and major donor capabilities for humanitarian assistance. It had representation from various military capabilities, the Canadian, the Polish, uh, the US, as obviously, as well as the UK, all participated. It then had numerous embassy staffs uh, participating. And then perhaps most importantly, it had everything from the, the kind of the big international humanitarian organizations to the tiniest, you know, former US soft guy who's now bringing in tactical first aid kits to, to the Ukrainian front who represented, you know, one plane load of aid. It had the, the whole gambit of participants. And the, the general framework here is it was an in-person meeting hosted inside of the US uh, kind of headquarters. They had occupied an arena, but it also had a digital virtual component. And, there, and I wanna highlight that as well because many, uh, and it's certainly true in, in Mali here where I am now, much of this is now being coordinated in this hybrid in-person and digital environment. And I can certainly speak to my nation and NATO is still lacking the IT infrastructure to be able to support cross-platform coordination on a large scale. And so many of us have our own uh, you know, defense-wide area networks or secure networks that simply do not talk and communicate to civilian uh, platforms. And so we end up using things like Zoom and uh, uh, Cisco and Teams. And so having that capability, I think is absolutely critical in order to help facilitate that CIMIC link to the, to the larger humanitarian and civilian environment, which again, if we're trying to win without fighting, we absolutely need to do because that's where the real horsepower uh, is. Next slide, please. So one of the other key ways that our civic capability was able to, to support the force and really support the overall response and the whole of government and comprehensive uh, solutions here was, was the really provision of really technical detailed assessments. So we mentioned Oslo guidelines earlier. Uh, we use those to essentially go into reception centers and assess them. The, the plus side of the Polish response is it was very grassroots led. So we had private industry uh, freeing up warehouse spaces. We had locals just showing up on their day off or uh, even after work shifts to provide humanitarian assistance. So that's really good in terms of horsepower and resources. The downside is there was very little technical training on how to deal with all the considerations and all the lessons learned that we've had in other refugee crises and IDP crisis. And so one thing the CIMIC team was able to bring in was some of that more technical advice and also being the link with it between our capabilities and the task force. So within the task force, we had psychosocial support experts. We had uh, a full doctor as well as uh, numerous nurses as and uh, we had Padres as well. And, and what we are able to do as CIMIC is through discussions with them, by coordinating with them, we are able to bring that very technical advice and reporting and integrate that into a report that then can be di then digested by the larger humanitarian uh, environment, as well as the Polish government itself. Uh, and, and it also allowed us a tool to work directly with the facility managers and provide some pretty pretty simple basic stuff so a really simple example of this is while the facilities had hand washing stations, they weren't being enforced. And so all we did was tell a Polish soldier who was standing there anyways, you need to make sure everyone washes their hands. And this type of activity had a direct correlation with drop rates of uh, infectious disease spreading. And that, that's like military 101, right? We all know before we eat, we wash our hands. But these, these basic level interventions weren't happening. And just that simple connection 
made significant differences to the status and well being of the Ukrainian uh, refugees. Next slide. And we can skip right through the next slide as well. This is just a blow up of that report. You guys have the side deck. Same with this. This is just us listing per sector who the humanitarian actors and organization leads are. Next slide. Actually, so while you're transitioning slides, just on that last slide, one thing to highlight is again in more of these developed nations is the increased role of the private sector. So when we think in when we operate in many countries that are closer to that developing world or failed state, there's not a huge private sector involvement in military operations or humanitarian operations. Again, that's not the case in Ukraine and it's not the case in Poland. The private sector was probably the single largest actor in the providing the support, whether it was hotels, warehouses, laundry facilities providing industrial cleaning for the reception centers, transport companies, bus companies providing that. It was all privately done. Uh, and the state ended up providing mechanisms by where they can reimburse them to, for the more sustained humanitarian response. But during that crisis phase, the single largest sector was private. And I think in, in some of our more domestic disasters, we see very similar things. Uh, building on the, the points in the, my UK uh, allies there is in terms of uh, civil outreach. So we have a bit of a, we're adopting, I would say, a similar perspective on how we can do very low level project support and outreach activities using minimal resources to create a uh, information environment whereby we can freely coordinate and discuss uh, with audiences. And so uh, top left there was we provided kind of a daycare service and movie night uh, experience for some of the uh, centers. And what that freed was the mothers who had essentially been doing daycare or childcare for their kids and many others, uh, three, four, five weeks straight with no rest. It gave them that brief respite. And so it can, at the same time, we then had Padres available to provide that mental social support. If we transition this to a more kinetic environment where there's an active threat, that secondary audience would then be freed for you know, more social engagement whereby we might get uh, you know, actionable inf information. And then obviously we're all familiar with kind of the quick impact project concept. Uh, and I'll speak more about that in a bit. Next slide, please. Uh, civil engagements, uh, you know, we're all familiar with these, the, uh, just the general involvement with local infrastructure. In the end, the strategic objective from Canada's perspective is to be physically seen helping the people of Poland and Ukraine, and we can only do that if we're visible at key events. Next slide. Uh, a product that I think we're mostly familiar with here is the creation of soldier cards. Again, Simic played a key role in making sure the key civil information was ref uh, reflected there. Next slide. Uh, what I'm going to do now is try and tie much of what we did all together and talk a bit about the UN and what's happening here, as well as the next. So next slide. So the first okay, presentation. So we got about two minutes, and I've got a. I've got a. Okay, I'll be very quick. Next workshop. So the, the, I guess really what I want to take with all of this, including the Poland mission, and it was talked about quite a lot in the first presentation, is this idea of a humanitarian operational environment. And so between military activities in Poland, military activities in Ukraine, Afghanistan what the UN itself is doing in MINUSMA anyways, we're seeing a very clear role of people in uniform or uniform-like uh, outfits conducting what is traditionally viewed as humanitarian activities. The, the So what to that is, the traditional reliance that humanitarians have on that perceived neutrality is, is now a much more complicated fight. And I think if we're talking about winning without fighting, we, we need those humanitarian actors to be able to do their jobs. And, and this to me is one of the top fights that I think CIMIC needs to start having with force commanders who see the instant immediate benefit of conducting, you know, HA activities. So top right there is a food donation that was uh, bilaterally organized by one of the nations being given. So instantly the locals like us, we look good. That short-term victory has a very long-term impact throughout the theater. And I, I just, that's my flag from a CIMIC perspective is that, us advising the commanders on the more long-term impacts of doing these very short win uh, activities uh, is very similar to in PSYOPs when we talk about using deception or lying to create a short tactical information gain, which has a long-term credibility impact. And so that would be, if I could summarize the whole thing, that would be my main point. And I'll close there. Well, I'm sorry that uh, we ran short of time here uh, because <laughs> Fascinating. But thank you so much for uh, for dialing in for us from uh, from from Africa, from Minusma, and 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 
you know, putting these two things together and they are very related. Uh, so that, that perspective, I think, uh, came loud and clear, at least I hope it did. Um, so with that, uh, what I'm gonna have to do, unfortunately, is close this down.